and we're live. All right. Hello, friends. Welcome to our next session. Uh, we have Dr. Sabine Seymour with us here today. Uh, she's going to be talking about how you can use data to monitor your lifestyle from food to exercise uh, to boost your body's resilience against disease. Um, oh, I think we're still live, even though the thing popped up and said we're not live. So we're going to roll with it. Um, Dr. Seymour, she, she is in uh, Austria right now. And she's an entrepreneur, researcher, and athlete. She's also part of our faculty at SU Portugal. So shout out to another one of our amazing uh, global partners that we have in Portugal that are delivering really fantastic content um, there as well. So as a technologist, uh, she conceives products at the intersection of sensors, data, and the body. As an economist, she develops wealth distribution and asset ownership models for citizens generate biometric and environmental data using distributed technologies. Her recent venture, Supa, is democratizing data by tokenizing the body, uh, which I'm sure we might hear a little bit more about. Uh, she runs a think tank called Moondial. It's the nexus between silicon and style for clients like Intel, Siemens, GE, and Disney. Gosh, this is just making me want to come and hang out with you. Um, <laughs> she was the inaugural professor and director of the Fashionable Technology Lab at the Parsons School of Design in New York. She led the research project Body Metaphor with co-research Miriam Steele uh, at the New School of Social Research, conceived the computational cellulose at Alto University, and was the chair of the Rockefeller Foundation funded computational fashion research initiative um, at the IBM Art and Technology Center. She's authored three books, Fashionable Technology, Functional Aesthetics, Computational Fashion, and currently works on social data capitalism. Thank you for joining us. I will step away. The floor is now yours. Thanks for being here. Thank you, and I will, I will try my best here. No rush. Sometimes these things aren't as easy as we always think that they are. Oh, we yes. Will, we will it still be works. here. All right, looks good. All right. Um, thank you, everybody, for being here. I hope you can hear me. Um, Ooh, hold yesterday. on, hold on one second. We've got. Uh, it looks like we had a little problem when you shared the screen. I think what you have to do is go, um, uh, go back out, go into present mode, and then share the screen. Okay. Uh, no, let's see. Let me, um, so stop. I'm gonna, what I'm going to do is I'm going to close the screen share real quick. Sorry, everybody. We'll get through this quickly. So, um, start the presentation, uh, like right now, and then come back into crowdcast if you can and share your screen. Okay. Let's try this again. Thanks How's that? Oh, uh, let's, I'll tell you. Oh, there we go. Beautiful. You're ready to go. <laughs> okay. Technology. So yesterday we heard quite a lot about COVID-19. Um, and I want to use this session to actually brainstorm on how lifestyle data uh, from an individual, uh, whether that is biometric nor environmental data can um, be used to create statistical patterns to understand uh, disease patterns, but also to understand outbreaks. So I actually was just skiing powder a week ago in Lech in Austria. And um, I was actually just asked to be in uh, quarantine because five cases were found in Lech. So right now I have been in quarantine um, officially since 12 o'clock of this uh, day, um, which is I think eight o'clock in Pacific Standard Times. Uh, but I've been already in quarantine since Friday when I left the ski resort. Um, so hopefully everything's good. Um, it's just a little close to home right now with friends and family. Um, but uh, what I wanna focus on is um, 
exercise and sports, um, one, um, data, and also how we can use food in order to understand and create um, the resilience for our body. Um, I'm basically an athlete 24 seven, and I'm considered a body sensorist. So as a researcher, like Adam said, I'm using data um, sensors and the body to actually create um, new products. And then as an economist, I'm actually creating new business models around uh, distributed technologies um, to ensure um, that we can actually build uh, D2C models for local food productions all the way down to creating synergies between different disciplines using data. I'm actually hearing a lot of feedback. So guys, if you hear that feedback too, please let me know. Um, so in the current situation, it is extremely important that we understand um, the actual data points. Um, and so um, what I'm trying to do here is um, to talk a little bit about how we want to democratize healthcare data in order to um, really use biometric and environmental data uh, captured across different devices and then use that data for disease predictions. The next is then to um, use that lifestyle data in order to create um, and construct and understand immune systems of individuals, um, how um, soon they would be able to get sick or would get sick um, in the current situation, but then also in the future, how does actually data that we capture um, in, can be used to impact their own health. Um, and then how do we actually use that? We actually have to create unbiased algorithms um, that at the same time own a, honor data privacy and then also um, used to limit um, the impact and the outbreaks of epidemics. So the data is really um, used to democratize healthcare um, and we really need to focus on that. So what we cannot do is we cannot be internally just really trying to stigmatize. Um, we cannot disregard human life. And from a global economic point of view, we cannot be you know, acting responsibly. What we can do is something what these guys at Stanford at Folding at Home are doing is really using computational power to um, recreate and simulate the uh, COVID-19 um, protein and so um, in order to actually really simulate a protein, you need extremely uh, computational power. And that is actually harvested uh, from different machines from individuals. So this is just one of the initiatives that is coming out um, from a crisis like this and in order to really fight it together. Um, but in order for us to think about uh, the future um, and a long term is we need to have longitudinal lifestyle data from people that are either biometric data, that is data from the body and or environmental data to understand the impact of the environment on us long-term. So um, we need somebody, we need to know somebody's lifestyle history. Um, and the data needs to be formatted in a way that it actually can be read across different disciplines, but then also across different stakeholders in healthcare. I just recently moved from the US back to Europe and uh, the formatting is, um, a nightmare because MRIs can be read, certain um, it, descriptions are differently, et cetera, et cetera. So what we need is we need to, one, capture the lifestyle data very early on. Um, we need to actually make it extremely seamless using wearable devices, for example. And then the third is we need to actually make it in a format that is helpful for everybody. Um, so when we now go back to where, uh, what do we want to start? We want to start with as early as possible. So as kids, we see this right now with COVID-19, there's a different um, uh, situation when you are a kid, zero to five, and then growing um, uh, with age is a different formatting. Um, a different way to actually deal with the disease. So if we now think about Gen Z population that's born after 96, let's say 98 now in 2000, uh, those are teenagers. They are prone to uh, uh, collecting a lot of data, being online a lot. Of course, digital natives, wearable devices, mobile devices, um, very well equipped um, and very knowledgeable. This is also the generation that currently within the last 12 years, if we now say 2008 is a financial world crisis, and now in 2020, 
we have another crisis, a health crisis. This is the first generation that sees those two crises within a period of 12 years. So it's going to be very, very impactful. So um, the 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 impact, the other impact that this generation sees, of course, is the environmental impact. So if we now look into Gen Z, Corona, and Greta, you actually have a, a very interesting um, group of, of of young teenagers whose health and whose um, biometric and environmental data we want to capture. And how do we want to capture it? We can use wearable devices like a blood pressure monitor here from with things, we can use connected fever thermometers, um, we can use um, rings or other types of accessories um, that can easily be um, attached uh, to and then monitored by a phone. Uh, in this case, it's the aura ring for sleep or for movement. Um, you can use, um, of course, the Apple Watch or other type of wristbound devices um, connected to your phone for sports, for example. You can do sports monitoring, environmental monitoring with different types of applications that are out there. This is Magic Seaweed for surfing, for example. You can go into the body and, and food per se. This is a, a scale. You can also do it um, with, um, with nutrition, really looking into uh, different types of foods that you're actually um, uh, capturing. So with all this, you, we can actually create digital real world evidence. And what that means is usually real world evidence is used when a drug is released in order to understand um, the impact of the actual drug um, on a certain population who are taking the drugs. But when we have now digital real world evidence, we can actually uh, develop and, and have and capture data before the actual, um, uh, before the actual drug is even um, developed. So what we can do is we can understand why somebody gets sick. Um, we can understand um, also um, their uh, entire lifestyle. Um, so um, that can then also be used to personalize, create personalized healthcare, really develop treatment programs um, that are um, relevant. Uh, so often drugs uh, might not be necessary, but very often it's a holistic approach. So it is the actually human drug, the synthetically manufactured. It can be, of course, um, also alternative therapies. Um, then it is, of course, um, exercise. And on top of it, we actually lay on the layer of food. Food is medicine. So this is basically a combination really creating a holistic approach in order to boost um, our immune system and our re resilience. Now, if we want to do that, what we need to do is we need to create unbiased algorithms. And unbiased algorithms are extremely important if you want to capture the entire population. So um, depending on where you live or your socioeconomic backgrounds or your color of your skin shall not actually matter. Um, we actually really think about creating a stamp of approval that um, makes sure that you have an inclusive algorithm that actually really understands the entirety of the world population. In this case, now that we have a pandemic, um, you, the, 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 the implications are even bigger. Um, so um, very important is that we also uh, allow access to um, this ty these type of um, uh, devices so that we actually uh, distribute those to communities that otherwise wouldn't have the ability to capture these type of data sets that are extremely important for uh, a worldwide understanding of a pandemic. Um, so the next um, phase to me is now if we talk about personalized medicine, we talk about food is medicine. So um, Hippocrates already a couple of thousand years ago was mentioning it as, as a metaphor um, instead of um, really just um, capturing or just using um, drugs, you can definitely also use food as a medicine, as an, as an implication um, to boost your immune system and so forth. Um, so you need to be extremely um, careful about what you eat, how you eat. Is it organic? Um, is it local? Nutrients um, need to be considered uh, when you eat food. And we had this amazing talk by Sarah just before, so I don't even want to go um, into, into a lot of detail here. So if you're interested in food is medicine, you definitely want to um, look into her talk um, that she just did a couple of um, um, speakers before me. 
Um, what I want to focus on, however, very strongly is exercise and immune system. So, um, and I want to read this quickly here. Um, a recent study, basically, evidence shows that the characteristics of the T cell pool appear to be influenced by leading an active lifestyle determined by exercise training, physical activity level, uh, or um, cardiorespiratory fitness. So extremely important, in particular, if you do outdoor um, fitness, if you do outdoor sports, the oxygen levels, the intake of oxygen, the exposure to sun, that thus the exposure to vitamin D. So in my opinion, um, you know, I can very much subscribe to this, um, being an athlete 24 seven myself, um, how um, food and exercise is actually um, providing resilience against certain diseases and certain impacts. Um, now, back again to data. Um, if we now capture all this data, what is very important, we need to make sure that we um, use the data ethically. The, the data ethics is very different from Europe to the US to China. And it has also changed. Now looking into, and I currently live in Europe, GDPR, which is the general data protection regulation in Europe, um, which came into effect uh, in May of 2010, or sorry, 2018, um, I wish. <laughs> um, and in California in uh, earlier this year, the CCPA, uh, it basically is about data ownership, uh, the right to be forgotten, um, the ability to actually be anonymized or the need to be anonymized so that you cannot trace back data and so forth. So all this uh, needs to be very well taken into consideration when we're creating new business models. And then so also finding the silver lining between a disease, a disease prediction, an epidemic, and then also, of course, privacy and data ethics. So that is going to be a very interesting endeavor, not only from a business perspective, but on also from a legal perspective and making sure that we honor um, privacy in this case. Um, the other thing is also um, through that, uh, what uh, shall not happen is the st stigmatization of people um, if they get sick. So again, if that is actually in the privacy of your home and you can um, make sure that the data is actually private, you actually make sure that you can democratize healthcare um, and the data in, in a way that uh, citizens are actually um, okay with it. Um, in order to create now business models with that um, is really how to develop those business models around, again, the legal ramifications of GDPR and so forth. But then also how can we do this in order to strengthen, for example, local businesses do direct to consumer use um, technologies like distributed technologies um, in order to create business models that allow not only the data to be um, shared and paid for and anonymized and then contextualized, but also to actually really think about the ability to create models that strengthen um, local providers of health services and of food and services as well. Um, so the anonymized data is something that, again, very dear to my heart, the ability to uh, create payment models, uh, cryptocurrency models, for example, um, in order to understand um, how people can get paid in an anonymized way for the data they're sharing. That is extremely important for us to create those um, statistical patterns. So what we must do is we must create products of social value that cover externalities to keep our environment clean and our human capital healthy. Um, so we want to digitize the body, but at the same time, we need to humanize technology in order to actually go out there and make sure that we can create those type of business models. Um, so thank you very much. And I hope that all worked and you heard me well.
And I'm back. Sorry about that. Uh, I clicked the wrong button and kicked myself out of the session. So uh, apologies, everybody, for that slight delay. And thank you so much, uh, Sabine, for that presentation. Let's go to uh, a couple. You have time for a couple questions, yeah? Yes, I do. And I did not, you know, I heard myself over and over again. So I hope I was. <laughs> I know that that ends up being the, the tricky thing with doing these is that um, as the presenter, you usually unless if you only have one monitor, you're kind of just looking at your presentation and you don't get that feedback of like, am I are the people there? What are they doing? What's going on? It's a different sensation. All right, let's see what people have. Um, all right, so let's and of course, if there's any of these questions that you don't feel comfortable answering, just say so and we'll go to the next one. First question, are there any particular foods, vitamins, supplements that you know of that are particularly good at boosting the immune system? Well, I mean, really, it very much depends on what type of deficiencies you might have or so. I mean, vitamin C, everybody's talking about vitamin C right now, but that's a, that's a given. So um, I'm not a medical doctor, so unfortunately, I wouldn't want to you know, give advice here. Fair enough answer. <clears throat> Okay, the next one. Uh, Fernando asks, I'm quite fit and exercise often. So in your opinion, uh, could I go surfing right now uh, without running the risk of getting infected? Um, if, yeah, I think, I think people are just asking like, can I, can I still go out and exercise right now? Oh, yes, please. Absolutely. But do it by yourself. I mean, that's really what everybody is asking for. It's like, just really make sure that if you do anything, you do it by yourself. Um, don't get hurt. Just don't overdo it because, you know, just don't get hurt. I mean, that's the only thing which is very, very important. You don't want to do anything that jeopardizes the healthcare system the way we have it right now. Yeah, and that's good advice. I was uh, went for a bike ride this morning, uh, which which felt good to get out and move and get some fresh air. Um, it's also been an interesting time. So my my wife and I are opening up a fitness studio here in Austin, and <clears throat> we're we're at our pre opening phase. And so we've been teaching a lot of our classes at at our house. And so about a week ago, we unfortunately had to cancel those. We wanted to make sure that people could still continue getting the exercise and the movement. So luckily, there's there's the online component. Um, as well, but we got to, got to keep moving. All right. So next let's talk about, uh, data privacy For, the question is how can we make data open source, uh, without, uh, impacting data privacy? So I, that's, that's a fantastic question. So it's, um, it's really thinking about the data generator, making sure that we cannot trace back the data generator. So we just need to have a few layers of security in between. The data itself per se is, I would almost argue, um, you know, uh, grains. Uh, you know, we need to basically make sure that the algorithms are making sense of those. Um, and so the data per se as data as a grain can easily be used and um, really is something we need. The data generate to where it is coming from, that is where it needs to be anonymized. So if we want to create uh, data sets that are open source and you as a data generator, you are okay with your data being out there but not being able to be traced back to you, it's very hard to do. Don't get me wrong. It's very hard to do, but that's basically where we, where we need to get to. Okay. Thanks for that. Let's go next to, uh, Kristen is curious. Are there, is there an example or a specific use case of these data sharing business models you referenced? Uh, that people might be able to go check out. There are there are a few that are coming up. Um, so if she's interested, please get in touch with me personally. Um, there are because of South by Southwest. Um, a few of those that would have been presented at South by Southwest are, have, well, not, I mean, yeah, we know it's not happening or it didn't happen. So, um, unfortunately, um, yeah, she can definitely get in touch with me. Got it. Are, are there any of those that you can, that are public that you can reference? Um, I don't want to do this right now, to be honest, uh, sure. because I don't know yet whether they want to have the next splash, uh, at, you know. Understandable. But there, are, there are some, and most of them uh, that I know of are European based. 
Okay. What's the best way for people to get a hold of you after this session? LinkedIn. LinkedIn. Okay. Yes. There you go. You heard it here first, folks. Uh, let's see. Uh, Dennis says that he is in. He just recently got into microbiome data. Um, do you have any thoughts on how that data could be used? Uh, absolutely. Um, so it, that data is an important aspect, um, also to think about, um, you know, different types of implications, immune system, healthcare, so forth. But that again is also something you want to contextualize depending on what it is needed for. So it's just a data set. Um, it, you know, if he if he's gotten into this, great. But we need to contextualize it. Understandable as well. All right, let's see what else has popped up. A uh, couple people are curious, and once again, you might not be the, the expert on this, so feel free to deflect it. Um, do you know if it's safe to go swimming right now? Um, like be, being out in any, any of these environments outside of maybe just the, the general fresh air? I, I mean, I'm not an expert. I'm, again, I'm not a health expert, but as, a, as an athlete, I would not see any problems or... Yeah. Fair enough. I mean, there's not the virus swimming in the ocean. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe it's in there and it's, it's just a lot, there's a lot more water I mean, than, it is, uh, yeah. than it is virus at that point in time. We need to be careful, but I think we, we don't want to, you know. Yeah, fair. What are some things that you're doing while you're in quarantine to stay healthy? Oh, wow. Um, so I do Pilates. Um, I'm basically, I'm, you know, running around the garden. Um, I'm eating very, very healthy. Um, I, uh, I'm trying to be, get, get some sun exposure at least. Um, if you're not, if you're inside, then, you know, you, you might want to open the windows as much as possible, air out the windows. Um, and, uh, um, yeah, I mean, I pretty much do everything I do every day anyway. So I do sports every day. Mm -hmm. Um, and you can do sit-ups, you can do push-ups, you can do Pilates, you can like, there is a lot of stuff you can do. Yes, that is true. What, um, one of the notes that I had written down when you were talking, um, I think about, about wearables, generally speaking, um, do you see a time in the future where our clothes could actually be the detectors for something like a virus where they get smart enough? Uh, maybe not a virus, but definitely, um, absolutely. So um, what we can do is if we if we use the textile as a second skin as a sensor, um, we can definitely uh, find out um, um, information, uh, sweat analytics, for example, um, heart rates, of course, they're already there, et cetera, et cetera. Um, what we need to do there is though, uh, we need to change the molecular structure of the fibers, um, and that is a big endeavor. Gotcha. Uh, do you, do you know of any companies that are kind of innovating in that, that space that you think people should check out? Um, I know that at Alta university, we did this project. So there's definitely, um, some, uh, some work done in Sweden. There's definitely some work done here in Germany or in Germany as well. Um, Fraunhofer Institute, uh, is, is, is also in that space. Um, um, I would see what Lensing does, what DuPont does, what Shella does, um, whether any of these guys are actually really, um, you know, thinking towards that. Um, a lot of stuff is done also, um, up at Cornell, um, uh, which definitely has a, has a great, um, has a great, uh, um, research area in that space. Awesome. Cool. We'll check those out for sure. All right. Well, I think that that is just about the end of our time today. Any parting thoughts for the audience? Um, stay safe and uh, social distancing. I know it's even, it's very, very hard for me. Very, very hard for me. I'm a hugger, but um, you got to stay away just um, a few more, more weeks. Yep. Good advice. Well, thank you so much for being here with us. Um, best of luck to you uh, under quarantine. Stay healthy. Um, and uh, maybe we can do a follow-up session here in a couple weeks and see how things are going. One of my surf friends said this is the best way to stay safe. Surfing or just making the hand signal? Going like this. Just Don't do like this. this. Don't do this. Just do this. <laughs> right. We're gonna see. We're gonna see so many innovations in handshaking and greetings coming out of this pandemic. It's gonna be fun. All righty. Well, uh, have a lovely evening. We'll talk to you later. 
Stay safe. Bye. Okay. See ya. All right, everybody, that does it for uh, Sabine on that topic. We have, we're going to go into a discussion with Alex Gladstein next. Um, Alex is usually talking to us about uh, blockchain and decentralization, um, but he also uh, has an affinity for some other related topics as well. So we're going to get into a, a talk about why authoritarianism is bad for public health um, and look at some of the responses from various governments. So this will definitely be um, uh, lots and lots of perspectives uh, shared here. I highly recommend going um, and grabbing an article that Alex recently published on Wired um, about this exact topic. So we're going to we're going to dig into that. And then uh, the team just posted some links. Turns out this is way easier than me flashing that slide up. So check those out. Um, we've got the shared resources document where we're trying to post links as fast as we can to the stuff that people post. Um, these are by, by no means uh, vetted and approved by Singularity, but we just want to make sure that you have easy access to what, what is being shared. Our job here is to uh, convene these experts uh, so they can share their perspective, their knowledge, uh, their expertise ultimately with you. Um, and as always, we recommend getting a diverse set of perspectives uh, before you make your own decision. So check out what we've got in there. Uh, we want to make that easy for you. I'm sure there's lots going on in the Facebook group. I haven't had a chance to get over to it. Um, but is there. We've got the YouTube playlist from uh, sessions from yesterday. And then, of course, we've got the six challenges up um, on Be Innovative. So go and visit those. Um, if you are, are new here, welcome. Uh, we're about to end this session and we'll be taking you over to see Alex Gladstein next. So I will be back here in five to 10 minutes. See you guys soon.